Connections really are vital on all levels. Without atomic connections, we fall apart physically. Without human connections, we fall apart psychologically. And without global political connections, the problems that plague our world may be insurmountable. And we seem to in innately understand the importance of connection. We remember the creation of old connections, for example, a, a diamond wedding anniversary, the Commonwealth Games, or that time we had to cycle all the way to Girton. <laughs> it's not just Roz who knows a lot about long, treacherous journeys, believe me. And we celebrate the forging of new connections at fantastic events like this. So we, we value connection innately. Um, I'm a physicist, I'm a particle physicist at the Large Hadron Collider. For those of you who don't know, the LHC is the European Union's largest and most expensive experiment. Apart from Greece, of course. <laughs> and in this capacity, I'm constantly fascinated about how the tiniest units in our universe come together, interact and connect to form structures on all scales, from the very tiny atom to the most awe-inspiring galaxies, with us nestled somewhere in the middle trying to work everything out. But I also have another passion, and that's for the connection outside from science to the outside world. Breaking down complex science information so it can be disseminated to any audience, whether that be expert fellow scientists, the interested but non-expert public, or Michael Gove, very much down at the far end there. <laughs> I'm really fascinated by scientific communication because science is something that affects us deeply. Science is the language that describes the universe around us, so it's the language of our common shared experience. Everyone is innately a biologist, a chemist, and a physicist, just by nature of being born into this world. And yet, despite these links we have to science, the public and science are not always the best of bedfellows. Let me ask you a couple of questions. What's your priority when you wake up in the morning? Is it pants, keys, toast, getting to work vaguely on time? I genuinely have to ask this, because as a PhD student, I'm rarely up before midday. Um, or is your priority actually understanding what we scientists are doing at CERN to understand the fabric of the universe this week? Let me ask you another question. How often do any of you discuss blue sky scientific research during your coffee breaks at work? As opposed to, say, Ellen's fantastic Oscar selfie, <laughs> or Benedict Cumberbatch's photo bombing, or, or Ryan Gosling's latest film? The point I'm trying to make is not that Drive isn't a fantastic film with a great soundtrack, it is. <coughs> the point is that on a day-to-day -day basis for most of us, the antics of celebrities are far more important than the fabric of the universe. And the reason for this is largely science's fault. Because science has allow allowed a large gap to appear between the way we present science and the way popular culture is propagated in the mainstream media. Science is slow and meticulous, it's complex and jargon-laden, so it's seen as dull compared to mainstream popular culture. In today's world, where we have so many subjects just a, quick a click away, it's often hard to realise what's important or vital, and it's easier to take simpler options than science. Think about this week, how many times you've made a decision between something work-related and something cat-related. In this BuzzFeed media marketplace, science needs a product which is catchy, condensed, slick, and quick. And this is something it often doesn't have, or something that it really struggles with. But why should we care? Why should we care that the science and the, pu the, science and the public are so disconnected? Well, there's many reasons we should care. First and foremost, there's many challenges that face our modern, connected world. Global warming, the global energy crisis, the continued global rise to prominence of Justin Bieber. <laughs> and the solution to all these problems lies in global scientific collaboration and knowledge dissemination. The public need to be effectively informed about science because the governments that will lead these collaborations are overwhelmingly democratic. So the public is required to hold government to account on scientific issues and motivate the political will. Effectively, the opportunity to make real positive change through science lies with you, the public. And it's a, it's a power we don't often realise, it's a power we don't often employ. The latest UK government and Ipsos Mori stats show that less than 0.5% of us identify the state of blue sky scientific research as a major factor affecting the UK today, and hence 
a major motivator behind our voting decision. And this is so frustrating to me because we can all think of examples where science has been negatively impacted by the public's opinion and political lobbying. Think about the stringent restrictions on stem cell research in the US due to lobbying by religious groups. This is a technology that could one day replace traditional transplant therapy. Or the dim view that's taken in this country of anything to do with GM crops. Crops that could one day feed the hungry in some of our most deprived areas of the planet. So imagine the positive impact that a well-motivated, well-educated public could have for science through effective political lobbying. There's also another reason to worry about the link between science and the public. And that's um, because a, a public that can understand the scientific method is one that can employ a healthy scepticism, a scepticism that helps it to avoid pseudoscience and scares. Possibly one of the most heinous examples of the public not understanding the scientific method is the rise of the anti-vaccination movement. In 1998, the UK journal The Lancet posted an article by Dr. James Wakefield purportedly showing a link between the MMR vaccine and childhood autism. Now, the science community rejected these claims. It showed that the claims were manipulated and false. And yet, despite that, the media furore around the article is thought to have led to over a thousand preventable deaths in the US alone. And outbreaks of diseases that we thought had been long since cured as late as last month, for example, in Prince Edward Island in Canada. So it's very important that the public understands the scientific methodology, or it can lead to tragedy even in our modern connected world. So how do we connect science and the public? Well, what we really need are new methods of science communication and new science communicators that, unlike Jennifer Lawrence, can stand on their own two feet in today's media marketplace. I'm going to start by showing you an example of the power of putting scientific communicators into mainstream popular culture. I'm going to start by asking you a serious question. What's your opinion of Francois Anglais? Anybody? So there's one person who has an idea who he is. Please. Great scientist. Okay, great scientist. So one person knew who this guy is, possibly. He's Belgian. Yeah, he's Belgian. <laughs> so the answer from most of you is who? Who's Francois Anglais? Francois Anglais is actually the 2013 Nobel Prize winner for physics. Along with Peter Higgs, he predicted the Higgs boson that we've heard so much about in the news recently. So this is a scientist who should be at the peak of his media fame. And yet nobody knows who he is. Let me ask you another question. What's your opinion of Professor Brian Cox? Please. Dreamy. Thro Sorry? Dreamy. Dreamy. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yeah, that's a good one. There's a few I came up with. Arrogant, intelligent, Manchester, nice hair, smiley, dreamy. The point I'm trying to make is that whatever your opinion is of Professor Brian Cox, whether it's positive or negative, you have one you don't have an opinion of a fantastic physicist like Francois Anglais. And this is, this is very interesting. It, there's, there's no doubt that Brian is a fantastic physicist and science communicator, but to the public, his reach is deeper than that. Nowadays, he's a style icon, um, a sex symbol, <laughs> and uh, as my mum very accurately puts it, a bit of all right. Brian has found a way to bring science to the masses and make science sexy. Indeed, since he's appeared on our screens, applications for physics at Manchester have never been higher. And what more positive evidence of his impact could we want? And it's this impact that shows us scientists the way forward with public audiences. When we interact with public audiences, we need to tailor our output. We need to use hooks such as comedy and popular culture references to break down scientific, scientific information and present it alongside things that public audiences flock to. And we need science communicators that pervade the mainstream culture, and whether we like it or not, show some of the values that public audiences enjoy. They need to be approachable, sexy, funny, and cool. This doesn't mean that the underlying science has to change. It just means that when we interact with the public, we need to be a little bit more relatable. We need more science communicators that are a mix of science and popular culture. We should be explaining physics. We, yeah. This is kind of what I'm trying to work towards. I'm a long way off there on both. 
We should be explaining physics in terms of the outcomes of Messi's free kicks. We should be explaining chemistry in terms of Breaking Bad with uh, obvious mitigators. And we should be explaining biology in terms of references to Scrubs and Grey's Anatomy because these are useful and interesting links that public audiences are excited by and engage with. And as an additional advantage, when the public see that scientists just like them are interested in things like this, we can start to break down the stereotypes of the scientist and we can start to present the true face of science, which is a multicultural, mixed gender pursuit full of people just trying to work for the, be for the greater good. And we can use these charismatic role models later to, to challenge other problems in our field, for example, the gender divide in the physical sciences. So in summary, in conclusion, we need to do better as scientists. We need to start to see outreach as essential. It motivates a political will, it procures funding, and it draws the next generation to scientists. We need to move away from science's publish or perish kind of methodology. And we need to allow time, money, and accreditation for outreach to the public. Maybe we should replace publish or perish with present or perish, whether that presenting be to fellow scientists or to the public. Because if we really want to change the public face of science, Brian Cox must be statistically significant. He must be more the rule than the exception. I want to close by showing you the impact that a high quality scientific communicator can have. I'm going to, show, um, to play you a short clip from my favorite science communicator, Carl Sagan's pale blue dot speech, which is a commentary on the world in which we live. From this distant vantage point, the Earth might not seem of any particular interest. But for us, it's different. Consider again that dot. That's here. That's home. That's us. On it, everyone you love, everyone you know, everyone you ever heard of, every human being who ever was, lived out their lives. The aggregate of our joy and suffering, thousands of confident religions, ideologies, and economic doctrines, every hunter and forager, every hero and coward, every creator and destroyer of civilization, every king and peasant, every young couple in love, every mother and father, hopeful child, inventor and explorer, every teacher of morals, every corrupt politician, every superstar, every supreme leader, every saint and sinner in the history of our species lived there on the mode of dust suspended in a sunbeam. Thank you. Carl Sagan himself said that we are a way for the cosmos to know itself. So we sure as hell better know a little bit about it. It's our job as scientists to make sure that you do know a little bit. And it's your job as our interested audience to tell us when you think you don't.